Welcome to week 10, the last week of uh, term one, um, and this is wireless networks. This is the last topic uh, that we are going to cover. Uh, we are basically going to cover only three sections from your chapter 7, 7.1 to 7.3, and this will be the um, basically the end um, of the uh, lecture series uh, in 3331-9331. Um, and today's topic is wireless network. So we, this is an extension of the data link layer that we covered um, last week. Um, but this is uh, the wireless uh, link layer. So you already know that uh, the wireless uh, mobile subscription uh, is significantly higher than wired phone subscriber at the moment. Uh, there are many people that did they just use the mobile phone. They do not have a landline anymore. Uh, we still have some landline, but uh, the ratio is five to one, or, and, and the ratio is increasing. And in, in the future, um, there may, be, may not be any landline fall at all. If you look at the wireless devices, then um, the, the devices that access the internet, uh, the wireless connectivity, uh, is actually becoming more popular and uh, maybe more than the devices that are uh, connected uh, via wireline. So there are two important challenges when you want to connect your device um, to the internet using wireless link layer. So the first one is the wireless part of it. So instead of a wire what you have is wireless. So how do you communicate over wireless link is, is a major challenge uh, as we are going to see uh, from the reliability point of view because a lot of things can go wrong in wireless um, that we take granted for the wired communication. The other issue with wireless is that the wireless devices are mobile. Uh, for example, you are uh, making a phone call and you are traveling at high speed and uh, this may um, create some other problems uh, because you are mobile you need to be connected to the network uh, through different points while you are in the same session so this is a um, uh, another major challenge and uh, in the wireless industry uh, these challenges are addressed differently through different technologies um, in this unit, we do not have uh, enough time to cover everything about wireless. So we are going to focus on the first point here. So we are only going to assume that the nodes are not highly mobile. They kind of stay in the same place, but they are connected via wireless. So what are the uh, challenges and what are the solutions? So let's uh, first uh, look at uh, some introductory uh, topics, but basically we want to cover the links. So wireless links, uh, what are the characteristics? And then we are going to study um, the, te the technology that allows us to connect devices wirelessly um, to the internet, uh, but devices, uh, but, but not necessarily support mobility, high speed mobility. And that's a standard from IEEE, IEEE 802.11, and also known as Wi-Fi. So we are going to cover that as well. This is just a background. Uh, you know, uh, perhaps from your year 12 physics, um, that uh, wireless or any other uh, electromagnetic wave, uh, they, have a, they are kind of periodic. So they go like this. And um, as they travel through space, uh, they cover some distance. And if you look at the full period, so here peak to peak is a full period, for example, then the distance that is covered in meter is the wavelength. And we use the Greek letter lambda to represent that distance, and we call it wavelength. And it turns out that wavelength is related to the frequency of the signal. So if you change the frequency, then the wavelength changes. As you can see in this picture, if the frequency is high, then this peak will be very close here. So the wavelength will be reduced and vice versa. So if the wavelength is longer, it means the next peak is coming far away. Um, so uh, the, the frequency 
the number of cycles or number of periods or number of repetitions that this wave can have will also reduce. So they are inversely proportional to this constant C, which is the speed of light. And this is very interesting, and this is true uh, for um, the uh, electromagnetic um, signal that is going through the wire or going through the wireless. So let's have a look at the elements uh, and the components of a wireless network. So whether it's wireless or not, you, you should have a network infrastructure. So in the network infrastructure, uh, this is like data center. Uh, there are a lot of switches and things like that. But uh, the, the users connect to this uh, network infrastructure to these uh, wireless cells. So, so these are kind of cells, wireless cells. So let's have a look at what are the components inside the wireless cells. So the first component is wireless hosts. So the examples are these laptops, mobile phones, iPads, and things like that. So you run some applications, um, but they can be stationary or they can be highly mobile. For example, uh, a laptop, you are sitting on a desk and so the laptop is static. But if you are using a phone in a car, then it's highly mobile. So how do you connect to the infrastructure? You connect to the infrastructure through these uh, base stations or access points which are connected to the infrastructure usually via wired links. This could be it's a backhaul link. This could also be uh, wireless, but usually they are fiber optic uh, and wired connection to the uh, backbone to the network infrastructure. And you only have to connect to the base station here using wireless. Um, these cells, um, if you have, uh, if you are in a cellular network, mobile network, wide area, then this is called a base station. But if you are using Wi-Fi, then this is called an access point. But basically, the idea is that they help you connect uh, to the uh, network infrastructure, to the global internet via wireless. So these are the wireless links, and that's why we don't have any line here because there is no wire line. So from here to the base station is a wireless link, right? And if you use wireless link, then you also need a uh, medium, medium access control protocol to coordinate the link access because this wireless space here is used by all these laptops and these mobile phones. Everyone is trying to use this wireless medium and they will collide. So you need a medium access uh, control. Here we see um, the data rate and the range uh, for the wireless technology. So all these 802.11, they are kind of about 30 meter, you get good communication and this is Wi-Fi. So we know that Wi-Fi, we use Wi-Fi at home and it's, it's usually within the 30 meter. But if you go outdoor, right, then you can extend up to 20 kilometers. Uh, but, but these days, usually the short, Small cells are about one kilometer or even less than one kilometer. So these technologies are the mobile uh, network technologies, wide area cellular technologies, 2, 3G, 4G, and now we have 5G. If you look at the radio spectrum, uh, which is basically the frequencies, um, then you can see that there are many applications for different frequencies. So, uh, for example, if you want to cell phones, then the frequencies are just below 1 gigahertz, all the way to about 2 gigahertz. And in 5G, we are using uh, some very high frequencies, such as, uh, you know, uh, 60 gigahertz. Um, and it, we, we have garage door openers, TV broadcast channels. You can see they are using in kilohertz uh, or uh, in megahertz. Then we have uh, satellite TV, uh, security alarms. So there's lots of applications of the spectrum or the radio wave. And um, this uh, slide gives you an idea of 
you know which frequency sets or which frequency bands are used by which applications at the bottom you can see the frequency is extremely high right so they are uh, getting close to terahertz uh, definitely above hundreds of gigahertz uh, but these, um, these 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 frequencies are very difficult to use at the moment for communications but they are used for other purposes such as x-rays or medical imaging and things like that and you can see light is sitting here so light the visible light so this is visible so you can see different colors um, this is also uh, an electromagnetic uh, radiation but this is visible This is a chart for from the Australian Communications and Media Authority, ACMA. Um, this uh, authority um, decides which uh, frequencies should be allocated to which businesses or which types of applications. So here you cannot read perhaps, uh, this is too small, but these are different uh, applications and you can see the allocations in the frequency band. What you can see here is that the, the frequency band um, below 3 gigahertz is, is very, very crowded. There's not much space left. But when it's extremely low, very low frequency, then it's kind of empty. You can see nothing has been allocated because it's very difficult to uh, you, uh, achieve high data rate at low frequency because there's not enough frequencies here. Um, but uh, here is also empty because if the frequency is too high, then also it's very difficult. We do not have the equipment, the hardware, and the technology yet. Now let's look at uh, the characteristics of the wireless links. So there are some important differences from uh, the wire, wire link. Uh, wireless links are, are very different. Uh, so there are um, three main differences. So the first one is uh, the signal strength, the decreasing. Uh, it decreases with the distance and uh, it depends also on the frequency as we are going to see very, very soon. This is called path loss. This path loss is basically losing the strength or losing the energy in the uh, signal at, as it travels. Um, in wired uh, communication, uh, this is also the case. The signal uh, does lose strength, but uh, in wireless, it loses much more significantly, much more faster. Uh, and that's why uh, it's difficult to receive the signal um, at, at a higher distance. Then we have uh, interferences uh, from other sources. Uh, for example, uh, if there are um, other um, devices which are also working at 2.4 uh, gigahertz uh, and you are using Wi-Fi, uh, then you have problem. Uh, even if they are not communication devices such as a, a microwave oven, then, uh, then also you have interference because you know microwave oven uh, operates at 2.4 gigahertz. So if you turn on the microwave oven, uh, then um, your Wi-Fi communication will be affected. Then we have multipath propagation where the radio signal um, reflects from other objects and these multipath um, interfere with the original signal. And because of these three things, um, it, it, the reliable communication, even over a point-to-point -point wireless link, is very, very challenging. So free space, if there is no other objects, there is no other multipath, then this is the equation uh, which shows um, the path loss. Um, so if you uh, transmit with uh, 4 watt, then you have to multiply 4 watt with this um, path loss to find out what would be the received signal strength. So you can see here, um, you can express it uh, either um, in units of lambda or in frequency, which is uh, linked to speed of light. And you can see uh, with the distance, uh, it's a square. So if you increase the distance, the loss increases uh, the square of the distance. 
And the same with the frequency. If you are working with higher frequency, then it increases uh, with the squared of the frequency. And this reflection, diffraction from other objects, and, and these um, terrain contours such as vegetations, they all affect um, uh, much more than the free space path loss. Even the humidity, for example, if you are working with um, a very high frequency, then the humidity in the air, the water vapor, for example, can affect the signal strength because they absorb uh, the energy in your uh, wave. So here an example of multipath effect. So if you have a, a transmitter here, source, and you have a receiver here, then the signal can go, this is called line of sight, straight, but the signal uh, also travels to all directions and it can bounce off the ceiling and you can see then it can come to you and it can bounce off the floor and can come to you. So you can see it's, there is self-interference. So you are getting the signal not only from the source, but you are getting uh, versions, uh, versions of the signal from other objects as well, and they interfere here at the receiver. So when you transmit, where the signals actually go. So this is called isotropic uh, transmitter. Uh, it means that uh, it goes in all directions uh, equally. So this is called the free space uh, or ideal uh, transmission. So in all directions um, it, it travels and then it is like a radius. So here you have the transmitters, the red dots, and the blue circles are the radius uh, of the uh, transmission. And you can see then they interfere. So in this case, there's lots of interference in particular here. So we have interference from this one, interference from this one, interference from this one. So it will be very difficult for you to work in this zone, for example. In real life, what happens, this is not really free space. There are many objects and um, the, the contour of your um, range of wireless is not a circle and uh, these are more realistic so when you so this can be like your base station uh, for example and then you have to see what sort of uh, contour uh, radio uh, range you have and then you can deploy different base stations to provide a nice coverage for a large area for example Another uh, interesting thing about the wireless link characteristics is the reliability and the signal strength. So what you see in the y-axis is your reliability. This is expressed in bit error rate. So how many bits are in error? Remember we studied about bit error um, and the detection of the bit error in previous lectures. So bit error rate is, for example, if it's uh, 10 to uh, minus 3, for example, it means one bit will be in error for every 1,000 bit transmitted. Uh, 10 to minus 2 means every 100 bit transmitted, one bit will be in error. So as you can see, as you go up the y-axis, your bit error rate is increasing. It means your reliability is decreasing. So for uh, good communication, reliable communication, uh, usually we would like a certain threshold, for example, 10 to minus 4. Um, and if it falls below 10 to minus 4, then it becomes very difficult because you will have to do a lot of retransmissions because, the, um, because of bit error, uh, the packets will not be um, accepted and then there will be no acknowledgement and you have to retransmit, for example. That can bring down the throughput of your communication. So if you have a threshold, for example, let's say 10 to minus 4, then this is your threshold, right? You want your bit error rate to be lower than that. Now, what governs uh, bit error rate? Um, SNR stands for signal to noise ratio. Uh, so, if your signal is very strong compared to the noise or uh, compared to the interference, uh, then um, you can decode the bits more reliably and the bit error rate would be less. So, you can see. Uh, when the signal to noise ratio decreases, then you get better uh, bit error rate. So bit error rate uh, significantly depends on the signal to noise ratio. 
So one thing you can do, you can um, it, uh, you can increase the signal strength by transmitting uh, with more power, for example. Uh, but in wireless, uh, because this is electromagnetic transmission, uh, increasing the power has some human health um, uh, complications, and that's why uh, there are some regulations for what's the maximum power that you can use. So in that case, um, you, you can control the received signal strength by uh, bringing your uh, device closer to the base station. If you move away from the base station because of the path loss that the signal strength decreases, it means the signal to noise ratio decreases. Um, it, it means that you are getting closer and it means bit rate is increasing, so it's becoming less reliable. If you are... Um, moving around then your signal to noise ratio is changing but if you want to keep the bit error rate below certain threshold what can you do okay so this is called coding so this qim stands for quadrature and amplitude modulation bpsk stands for binary phase shift keying we are not going to study the details of these things. Um, the, we, we have another uh, course here at UNSW called uh, COMP4336 or 9336, uh, which is called Mobile Data Networking. And I'll, I'm going to teach that uh, in the next term. And if you take that course, then in that course, we explain all these things and go deeper into wireless and mobile communication. But basically what it means, this coding means, is that uh, if you, for a given signal strength, you, you have an optimum coding which can achieve certain bit error rate. So, uh, for example, but then your data rate decreases. For example, here you can say binary phase shift king. It means that there are only two different uh, modulation possible for a signal um, wave. Uh, so it's the simplest modulation. That's why the bit error... Um, capacity or the data rate is very low but it's also reliable so if the signal to noise ratio is very low and you still want a very low bit error rate uh, i.e. high reliability then you have to choose something like BPSK uh, but as the signal strength increases and if you still want to achieve the same bit error rate for example then you can move up the coding and increase the data rate so you can see the data rate, signal-to-noise ratio, reliability, they are all interrelated. Now we are going to look at uh, two specific problems uh, that is beyond the link. Uh, even if the links are working okay, even if there is no bit error rate, we still have this hidden terminal problem and exposed terminal problem. So first we are going to look at the hidden terminal problem. So what do we see here? Uh, the three nodes, A, B, and C. And what you see here is that A can hear B, so there is no problem. Um, B can uh, hear C, there is no problem. But let's say there is a wall here, and the wireless signal uh, doesn't go through the wall very well. So A cannot hear C, and C cannot hear A. So what is the hidden terminal problem? The hidden terminal problem is that when A wants to transmit to B, it, 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 it listens uh, to the channel and it, it cannot hear C. So it, A thinks that nobody is transmitting, so A starts transmitting. And at the same time, when C is listening to the channel, it cannot hear the transmission of A because of this wall. So C thinks nobody is transmitting, so C starts transmitting to B. Now. The signals that B is receiving, the receiver of B is receiving signal from both C and A. So there is a collision uh, happening at B. So B cannot um, recover uh, either A's transmission or C's transmission. As a result, there is a collision. So what we see here is that the carrier sense uh, is ineffective here. So the carrier sense uh, to avoid collision is not working. And Let's, let's see uh, why this is happening uh, through, uh, through another um, diagram of signal-to-noise ratio. So at the right-hand side here, what you see is uh, the signal strength as it starts to travel from A 
starts to decrease in space, right? So when it reaches B, still it is strong enough, but after that it starts to fall very quickly. Remember, with distance, it falls off square of the distance. So as you increase the distance, it falls rapidly, quadratically. And by the time it reaches here, in this space where C is located, the signal strength is so weak <clears throat> that C cannot decode, C cannot uh, even uh, understand that there is a signal here. And that's why C cannot hear A. The same thing when C transmits, it is good up to this point, so B can hear C, but after that it starts to fall off rapidly, and by the time it reaches A, A cannot decode it, A cannot detect that C is transmitting. So this is a problem, and that's why uh, this is called hidden terminal problem, and carrier sense is not uh, very effective in uh, avoiding collision when there is a hidden terminal problem. We have another problem. This is called exposed terminal problem. And this problem is, is that the carrier sense would prevent a successful transmission. So in the previous one, hidden terminal problem, we have seen that carrier sense is not adequate to prevent collision. And here we are seeing that carrier sense is actually preventing a successful transmission which could otherwise be transmitted. Um, so let's have a look. So again we have A, B, C but we also have D. So um, if B is transmitting to A then uh, A is receiving it okay but because C is within the radius of B, C can hear that the channel is busy. So even if C wants to transmit to D, because it finds the channel is busy, the carrier sense prevents it from transmitting. As a result, C uh, stays away from transmitting to D. But if, if C did transmit, there wouldn't be any problem, because um, if it was received by the receiver of B, there is no problem, because B is not receiving anything from A at that time. B is actually transmitting. So, uh, the, the, the transmission uh, is not uh, actually affected by the, the receiving from B. So C actually could transmit and we could have a communication between C and D and a communication between B and A simultaneously without any problem in this case. But because of the carrier sense, C is preventing itself. C is, is, uh, is locked and we are losing some opportunity here for transmission because of carrier sensing. So this is called exposed terminal problem. So in summary, you can see that um, in wireless communication, uh, if the link is wireless, that it's not just the bit error rate that uh, can have a problem, a high bit error rate. Uh, we can have other problems such as a hidden node problem and exposed terminal problem. Now we are going to look at uh, the wireless LANs. Uh, you know this is very popular. You are only using it um, to access the internet from home or in the lecture theaters. So we, we want to see how the wireless uh, links are used uh, in wireless LANs. Wireless LANs is basically the link layer uh, technology. Wireless LAN uh, is basically a standard uh, from IEEE um, and the standard is 802.11 and the uh, alphabets here, the letters like B, A, G are giving different versions um, and it started in 1990, uh, early 1990s and uh, at that time uh, the capacity uh, or the data rate was 11 megabits per second and it used uh, frequencies like 2.4 gigahertz and also 5 gigahertz um, and then the speed starts to increase over the years from 11 megabit per second to 54 megabit per second with a and uh, but using only 5 gigahertz then with g both for 2.4 and 5 gigahertz 54 megabit per second then we went to 200 megabit per second with 11n when multiple antennas were introduced um, and with 11AC, which is the current uh, widely used uh, Wi-Fi routers, um, yeah, we have um, almost uh, 1 gigabit per second, um, and it's using 5 gigahertz. 
Um, so 802.11 is from IEEE standard numbers. Uh, this is getting complicated with A, G, N, A, C, and there are some new ones like A, X, and A, D, A, Y, and things like that. So it's sometimes it's d difficult to track down. So the um, Wi-Fi Alliance is introduced uh, numbers. So 802.11 N started with N. So this is called Wi-Fi 4, and A, C is Wi-Fi 5. So the new ones like AX uh, will be called Wi-Fi 6 and so on and so forth. So the uh, important thing here is that irrespective of which uh, Wi-Fi you are using, they are all using this medium access control CSMSCA, which we are going to study um, today. So CSMSCA is the multiple access technology. CS stands for collision avoidance. But before we study CSMSCA, um, let's uh, find out uh, how the uh, nodes can actually get connected automatically uh, to the base station and eventually to the internet. So the way it works is through this basic service set. Remember, we were calling it a cell. Uh, in Wi-Fi, this is called a basic service set. The idea of basic service set and there is that there is only one access point. Uh, in one basic service set and all the devices need to um, associate with this access point. Uh, so this is the link layer association and once you're associated uh, with it then you can get connected to the internet through IP. And all these basic service sets, um, they are then connected to the internet through some router or switch. If it's connected through this router then this basic service set and this basic service set will be two different IP subnets. So what is this association? Uh, the idea uh, comes from these uh, access points. So uh, we are going to see that there are some specific channels that access point listens to. And there are 11 different channels that have been standardized and you have to find out which channel this particular access point close to you is working on so you can associate with this access point um, through, through that uh, frequency. Um, so SSID is the name of that um, access point or that um, basic service set and uh, you will see that through beacons. So the beacons are frames that are advertised by the access point periodically to advertise which channel it is listening to, what is the name of the SSID, what is the MAC address of this access point and things like that. So uh, if you are near an access point then you will be able to hear these beacons and get this information that you can select which access point you want to associate um, and there would be some authentication um, process to make sure that you are a legitimate user and you have the um, necessary credentials and the permission to get associated with this access point. And once you are associated, then you can use the DHCP service to get an IP address. So let's see how the association is actually done automatically through protocols. Okay, before the association, so the, the channels are like you start from 2.4 gigahertz, so this, this is in megahertz, up to 2.4472 megahertz, right? So this is in the 2.4 gigahertz band, but there are 11 channels. For example, channel 1 starts here and st it stops at 2.422. Uh, the channel 2 starts here, 24407, and it ends at 2427. So you can see channel 1 and channel 2 are kind of uh, overlapping. And uh, you can see channel 2 is also overlapping with channel 6. So many channels are overlapping with each other, but there are three channels, channel 1, channel 6, and channel 11. They are not overlapping. There's nice gaps. And as a result, most of the access points are configured to listen either channel 1, channel 6, or channel 11. But sometimes you can configure it manually to, to listen to any of these channels because these are the standard ones. Okay, so let's see how you can, um, how the nodes get associated uh, automatically. What's the protocol? 
So there are two different concepts. One is called passive scanning and one is active scanning. So the association happens through this scanning. So let's first look at the, uh, the passive scanning. So there are three steps. In step one uh, is passive. So uh, the laptop is not transmitting anything in the beginning for association. It's just passively listening the beacon frames. So in step one, it receives beacon frame from this access point two and access point one, right? And then it can make a decision uh, which one it wants to connect. So let's say that uh, laptop decides that it wants to connect to access point two. And uh, so in step two, it, it sends uh, an association request, uh, association request frame to access point two. And then, <coughs> excuse me, if access point two accepts it, then it sends a response, association response frame uh, back to access point one. And in that case, uh, access point um, is back to uh, laptop, and the laptop is now associated with access point two. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is passive uh, scanning. Um, the, the the problem with passive scanning is that the laptop will have to wait for the beacon, and until it gets the beacon, it cannot send uh, the association request. So. It may not be as fast uh, as uh, you want. So if you want very fast uh, association, immediate association, then we have active scanning. So let's have a look at active scanning. So here we have active scanning. So the first step is uh, the laptop has to actively generate uh, a, a probe request frame broadcast. So the laptop step one, it broadcast a probe request saying, is there any access point nearby? So this is received by both access points. So in step two, both access points are going to send the probe response frame saying that, yes, um, I am an access point and this is my channel and this is my uh, MAC address and things like that. So this is kind of like the beacon. Um, and uh, in step three and four, you can do the association. So step three and four here is same as step uh, two and step three. So step one here, the beacon frame is replaced by step one and two. So this is immediate. So as soon as you send, you can receive uh, the beacon from the access point or the probe response. So active scanning um, is useful when you want to reduce uh, the time uh, to associate with the uh, basis station uh, or the access point. Now we come to the multiple access uh, for uh, wireless. So if you remember, um, we need to, um, uh, when there are two or more uh, transmitting stations in the wireless, there may be collisions. Um, for example, uh, you can see here that when A and C transmits at the same time, uh, their uh, transmissions may collide at uh, receiver B. Uh, the problem um, is that in wireless, there is no collision detection possible. Uh, if you remember uh, that the reason that collision detection is not possible is the transmitter and receiver is next to each other. So when you are transmitting, you cannot actually uh, receive um, uh, other uh, transmissions because the, the transmitted power overwhelms your receiver, uh, which is just next to it. So because no collision detection is possible, then uh, we have to do some collision avoidance. And that's why it's called CSMA CA, collision avoidance. Collisions actually happen at the receiver, not at the sender. So uh, there is uh, so if there are uh, two transmitters transmitting, the collisions are not happening at the transmitters, but the collision is happening at the receiver if the receiver is receiving transmissions from two transmitters at the same time. So basically, the goal of this CSMA um, for wireless is to tell the senders uh, who might interfere with the receiver to shut up. So how can we do that? The pro protocol that 
tries to implement CSMA is called DCF, Distributed Coordination Function. So this is implemented in the chip, um, the Wi-Fi chip that you have. So this is how it works. Um, first of all, DIPS uh, stands for DCF Interframe Space, and CIFS stands for Short Interframe Space, it's shorter than DIPS. So we are going to see how DIPS and CIFS are used uh, for um, avoiding collisions using DCF. So the first, if you want, if a station wants to transmit something, it has to sense the channel and see if there is any uh, signal um, in the channel. If the channel is idle, then um, if it is idle for dips period, right? So it has to be idle for some time before you can transmit. So if it has been idle for dips amount of time, then you can transmit the entire frame. Remember, there is no collision detection, so you cannot abort. Once you start transmitting, you have to transmit the whole frame, entire frame. If you sense the channel busy, then you have to back off. So you start a random back off time. And as when the channel is idle, then the, the timer is decrementing. And when the timer expires, then you can transmit. Okay, after transmission, you wait for acknowledgement, right? But if you don't get any acknowledgement, then you have to back off again and repeat too. You have to retransmit this packet because if there is no act, then it means that your frame might have collided with other frames and that's why there is no acknowledgement. So at the receiver, what are you doing? So if the frame is received okay, then you wait for a small interval, SIFS. Uh, and then uh, transmit the ACK. So let's uh, have a look at the uh, timing diagram at your right. So as you can see, uh, the sender uh, is waiting for DIPS interframe packet interval. Uh, so if it finds that the channel is idle for DIPS amount of time, then it transmits the whole data frame. So this is the uh, green data frame. And if the receiver receives it correctly, then it waits for SIF's amount of time before sending the acknowledgement back to the sender. So the question is, how do we avoid uh, collision? Because um, there can be hidden terminal. It means that when you sense the channel idle, there may be another transmitter who also sends the channel idle. Both of them are transmitting to the same receiver and there, there is a collision. Uh, so yes, you can retransmit, you can wait for acknowledgement and retransmit, but you are wasting a lot of resources uh, by retransmitting. So um, it would be a good idea if we could avoid the collision in the first place. So one idea to avoid the collision in the first place, rather than recovering from collision through retransmissions, is to reserve the channel before you transmit. So no other transmitters will transmit to this uh, receiver at the same time. So how can we reserve the channel? So the way you can reserve uh, is using RTS and CTS frames. So RTS is request to send and CTS is clear to send. So you send an RTS um, and anyone who hears that RTS uh, will stay away from uh, transmission and then uh, you can transmit and then when you are done you send the cts is clear so someone else can transmit so let's have a look at uh, an animation uh, to see how rts cts work so we have uh, station a and b uh, both would like to communicate with access point here and um, a one sends an RTS. Let's say that B also sends an RTS at the same time. So there is a collision at the access point. So they are not successful in the beginning. Remember that RTS is, uh, is a uh, packet to reserve. So um, RTS is sent without uh, any reservation. It, it, it itself is a mechanism to reserve, but it is subject to collision. So in this case is collided, so um, A will uh, try again. And this time it was successful, right? 
So um, RTS uh, is received correctly by the access point, uh, but uh, CB cannot actually um, hear A. So what access point has to do, it has to generate a CTS. So this CTS is now heard by both A and B because both A and B are equal distance from access point. So the CTS is saying is that I'm giving permission to station A. So A receives it, so A will transmit, but when B receives it, it says that this clear uh, signal is for A, so it will stay away. So A sends the data, but uh, B, after receiving CTS A, it defers it until it receives an acknowledgement. So when the access point sends the acknowledgement, the acknowledgement is received by both A and both B. At this point, B can uh, attempt to transmit. So what we have seen here is that uh, using RTS and CTS, uh, it is possible for a station to reserve the channel so the other station uh, differs and, and do doesn't compete uh, with this station. As a result, uh, there is a collision is avoided. So similarly, for example, when access point wants to uh, transmit uh, to A, for example, it sends an RTS, and this RTS is received by both A and B. So A, A, A transmits CTS. So in this case, because B receives uh, an RTS signal from access point uh, indicating that it wants to communicate with A, B doesn't attempt transmission. So when A sends uh, CTS and gives the clearance to access point, access point sends the data and then the acknowledgement comes from A. So in this case, because B is not attempting, uh, there is no collision uh, from other stations. Right, so let's take a quick quiz. Um, so what's, which sequence is correct? Uh, when you are using uh, CSMSCA using RTS CTS. So the first one is saying you, you do RTS CTS data and then CTS. Second one is saying you first do CTS, then RTS. The third one is saying you do RTS first, then CTS, then data, and then acknowledgement. And the fourth one is saying you do RTS, then you get an acknowledgement, then you send data. You can see these don't, don't make sense because you don't get acknowledgement before data and you never transmit CTS first. Remember, RTS has to be first. So everything points to this one. This is the correct answer, C. So you first send RTS, then you send CTS, then data, and then acknowledgement, as you can see here. RTS first, then CTS, then data, then acknowledgement. Which multiple access technique is used by IEEE 802.11? A, CSMA, CD. C, CD is, means collision detection, but collision detection is not possible in wireless, so this is not possible. B, slotted aloha. C, CSMA, CA, collision avoidance. D, TDMA, E, FDMA. So if you remember, uh, we used CSMA and collision avoidance uh, using RTS, CTS. So CSMA, CA is the answer. This is what that's used by Wi-Fi. All versions of Wi-Fi, 802.11, A, B, G, and A, C. So that kind of brings us to the end of the wireless link layer. And just to summarize, we have looked at um, the uh, implications of distance um, for wireless link and how the bit error rate and the signal-to-noise ratio are uh, related to each other and how uh, we can have uh, interference uh, in the wireless link. Then we looked at uh, the popular Wi-Fi technology and uh, how the, uh, we can recover from collision using acknowledgement or you we can avoid uh, collision altogether by using uh, collision avoidance techniques which uses RTS-CTS. So this uh, formally concludes all the contents uh, for this course. Um, we are not going to cover any new contents. So I just wanted to remind you that uh, we are still waiting uh, for your feedback, uh, which is very, very important for us. 
um, especially during this time as we uh, switch to uh, many different modes of <laughs> communication and, uh, and lecturing. So we are eager to hear you know, how we served you and whether you have any feedback for us to uh, improve. So please uh, go to my experience and let us know what you think and especially if you have any ideas to improve that would be very very useful for us uh, because in the foreseeable in the near foreseeable future we might have to run these lectures again uh, uh, online uh, so this is completely anonymous so please uh, give your feedback and i expect that every one of you will give your feedback uh, it doesn't take you uh, more than five to ten minutes to give us the feedback so with that i would like to wish you all the best uh, for your um, the rest of the term uh, you know that your uh, exam uh, would be on the 8th of may uh, but i'll create another uh, small uh, lecture a short lecture uh, to explain uh, the final exam so all the best and wish you good luck.